You should have found a treat on your seats with a very unusual and rather intriguing name. There are some spare ones. If you're not quick, I shall scoop them up before I go. Tony's Chocolate Only isn't your average chocolate company, they tell us. It's a chocolate company with a huge mission to end modern day slavery and exploitation in the cocoa industry. With amazing chocolate recipes, they aim to set the example and show that chocolate can be made in a more responsible way, in taste, in packaging, and the way they build long-term relationships with cocoa farmers, and the way they handle an open and transparent value chain. Their products, I noticed recently, are stocked in my local deli, and it's a very discerning deli indeed. Inzo Van Zanten is Tony's Choco Evangelist. I've never met one of those before, but he's right here to tell us the story of Tony's roadmap towards 100% slavery-free chocolate and how everyone can join this movement. Please welcome Inzo Van Zanten. So, hello. My name is Inzo and I'm indeed the choco evangelist of a small Dutch chocolate company. And I'm here to tell you a bit about chocolate, but mostly I'd like to talk to you about happiness. Because I believe chocolate might be the most concentrated piece of happiness in the world, right? Chocolate might be the magical solution to everything, I say at home at least. Uh, if you have a crappy week, there's nothing better to fix that crappy week than a good big chunk of chocolate. If you're having a great week, there's nothing better to celebrate that great week than a good big chunk of chocolate, right? So it's the solution for everything. Um, now, I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news that is that you're all going home with chocolate, and if you're really being Dutch about this, you might go home with two bars of chocolate. Um, but the bad news is that chocolate comes with a price, and that price is called awareness. Because in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you about a very bitter side to chocolate. Chocolate grows around the equator. Uh, cocoa grows around the equator. It's a little bit <laughs> chocolate. <huh? laughs> Sorry for that. It was a long flight from Amsterdam. Um, cocoa grows around the equator. It's a little bit of cocoa that comes from Asia. There's a little bit of cocoa that comes from South America, where originally cocoa comes from. But the majority of all cocoa is grown on millions of tiny farms in Western Africa. There's no big cocoa plantations. These are all one, two, three hectare family-run farms. Um, and the other end of the value chain, there's billions of consumers like you and I who just want to be able to eat a full bar of chocolate every single day in your life without having to feel any sense of guilt, right? But in the middle of the value chain, there's only a handful of companies that are uh, producing chocolate from cocoa. These are Cargill and Colabo and the better known brand names like Nestle, Mars and Hershey's, Mondelez. It's only a handful of companies and it's in their interest that the price of cocoa remains low. In our opinion, that price is inhumanly low. Because how does that look of a bar that's sold for around four pounds in the stores here in the UK? No more than about 10 pence go to the farmer that grows the cocoa. And to put things in perspective, the average cocoa farmer grows about 1,000 kilos of cocoa beans per year. For current market price, which I don't know in British pounds, I'm very sorry, but we're still Europeans, aren't we? Uh, 1 euro 17 per kilo, that means they have less than 1,200 revenue, euros revenue per year. And that leads to the average person in Ivory Coast, the average cocoa farmer in Ivory Coast, living of 46 cents available income per day which is way below the poverty level that's stated at 2 euros and 10 cents for a country like Ivory Coast. And we think that value chain is very, very unequally divided. Now, how does that look? From two countries in Western Africa, Ivory Coast and Ghana, comes about 60% of all cocoa in the world. And that's grown on about 2.5 million farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast alone. And on those farms, there's 2.3 million children that work there of which 90% work under illegal circumstances. Illegal not only according to the International Labour Organization, but mind you, also illegal according to local laws. And they work with heavy machinery, uh, work with chemicals, uh, walk around with bags of cocoa that weigh 60 kilos per bag. Just imagine a kid of five, six, seven years old with 60 kilos on his back. And they tend to not be able to go to school. 
And in the worst case, the latest figures of the Global Slavery Index show us that at least 30,000 children are subject to something that we call modern slavery. So they're lured from the neighboring country like Burkina Faso under the false pretenses that they get to work in the cocoa industry in Ghana and Ivory Coast and get to earn some money and send that back home. And these kids get lost in the cocoa industry. Now these are statistics, but let me introduce you to a couple of these kids in a little movie. Je suis comme ça me félix. J'ai 16 ans. J'ai travaillé dans une plantation de cacao de 1999 en 2003. Je m'appelle Kamko Herman. J'ai 18 ans. J'ai travaillé à la plantation de cacao 1999 en 2003. Je m'appelle Kam Touré. J'ai 18 ans. J'étais travaillé dans la plantation en 1999. Je n'étais pas payé. J'étais forcé de travailler. J'étais forcé de travailler. Je n'avais pas la liberté pour quitter les coins. On ne m'a pas payé. On m'a forgé de travailler. Et puis on ne vous laisse jamais causer entre parents. Si on te voit causer avec ton parent, bon, on te tue ou bien tu te, te mates très bien là et puis on te fait changer de compte. Now, if you realize that in the middle of the value chain, there's only a handful of companies that produce chocolate that are responsible for these problems in the cocoa industry. You could also realize or think that if it's only a handful of companies that's responsible, then the problem is easily solved, right? And the same idea came to mind to two American senators, Senator Harkin and Senator Engel, that set up the Harkin-Engel Protocol in 2001 to eradicate the worst forms of forced child labor from the value chain of cocoa. And the Harkin Engel Protocol was signed by all the CEOs of the big chocolate companies. On behalf of the companies, but also on behalf of themselves personally. And then you'd think you're there, right? But the Harkin Engel Protocol is and was a so-called non-binding agreement. Well, non-binding agreements don't get us anywhere. And it shows because now, almost 18 years later, none of the goals in the Harkin Engel Agreement have been achieved. And in 2005, there was a Dutch television show called Keuringsdienst van Waarde, which is more or less the 60 minutes of food. So a Dutch journalistic investigative program that looks to the reality behind the, let's say this in blunt Dutch, the bullshit of marketing. And Teun van de Keuken, the journalist in this program, was utterly shocked when he realized that nothing had been changed almost halfway through the timeline of the Harkin Engel Protocol. Nothing had actually been done towards change. But Tone had an issue because Tone is a television journalist and none of these big trucker companies wanted to speak to him, wanted to do an interview with him. And he didn't have any footage for a television show. So he said, you know what? I'll come up with a smart idea. And he bought 10 different bars of different brands of chocolate of which he was sure that somewhere in the value chain there was some sort of forced child labor in there. And he put a camera on himself and he called the international alarm number, 112. And he said, I want to turn myself in as a chocolate criminal. It was quiet on the other end of the line. You can imagine the lady didn't get these calls every day. And Tone said, uh, the lady said, why? And he said, well, according to international law, if you're aware of criminal activities in the value chain of a product that you buy, you're responsible for those criminal activities. Tone said, if at the end of the afternoon in a shady park in Amsterdam, I buy a ridiculously cheap second-hand bicycle from a guy that doesn't smell too well, I can rest assured I'm buying a stolen bicycle and I'm responsible for the theft of the bicycle. It's called fencing. And by knowingly buying and consuming chocolate of which I know that there's forced child labor in there, I'm responsible for financing child slavery. So you have to come and arrest me. I turned still wasn't being taken seriously. That lady actually hung up. Uh, and Tone hired an expensive lawyer and had a court case set up against himself which was a first for the lawyer too, who was normally asked to keep people out of prison. And in this case, he was asked to get somebody into prison. And uh, Tern, after a lengthy process, or the judge after a lengthy process said, Meneer van de Keuken, we, morally, you're completely right. But legally, I can't prosecute you because I can't prove the causality between, between the, the chocolate that you ate and the beans that were picked from, by Cam Herman from the movie who was flown in as a witness in the court case. So Tone had an issue, 
because he didn't have the footage of interviews for his television show and he didn't have the verdict by the judge that he was looking for. So he said, you know what? If you tell me that's the way the system works, I'll change the system from within. And Tone started his own little chocolate company, Tony's Chocolate Only. Tony's, the international name for Tone, horrible Dutch name, and Choco Lonely for his lonely battle in the chocolate industry, hence the unpronounceable brand name that we chose. Uh, and it works like a charm. I think 80% of the Dutch people pronounce it wrong, say Tony, Chocoloni or something. It can always be worse. The other day I was at a conference and I was introduced as Inzo from Toco, Chocoloco. <laughs> All right, he could have done his homework a bit better. Anyway, Tony Chocoloni was born in 2005, a small uh, chocolate company, but with a huge mission to not only make our own chocolate 100% slave free, but to make all chocolate worldwide 100% Slave free. Ja, goedemiddag. Goedemiddag, is dit Alain de Laat? Jawel. Meneer de Laat, u spreekt met Teun van de Keuken uit Nederland. Jawel. Weet u nog wie ik ben? Ja, ik weet wie u bent. Nou, ik heb een tijdje geleden bij u allemaal chocola gekocht, hè? Ja, ja dat klopt. Ja. En we zijn uh, vanochtend begonnen met de, met de verkoop. Ja. En u moet eens even raden hoeveel we er hebben verkocht. Oh, uh, duizend? 13.000. 13.000? Ja. Oei, dan heb je een probleem, hè? <laughs> ja, dan heb ik een probleem, ja. We had 5,000 bars made, thinking we could run a company on 5,000 bars, and they were sold out in the same morning. So we had a bit of an issue. And it's been going really fast since then. I mean, we're really proud of the fact that recently we became market leader in the Netherlands, outdoing all traditional competition. Um, but we, yeah, so this is our, this is our stats from the last uh, couple of years, which is quite amazing. We even surpassed 20% at the moment. And the best-selling chocolate bar is now also available in the UK, the best-selling chocolate bar by far in the Netherlands, which is our caramel sea salt bar, which sells more than twice the amount as the next best-selling bar in the Netherlands, which is our milk chocolate bar, fortunately. Um, but even though we became market leader, we really strongly believe in maintaining that culture of this small and very engaged company. Because a wise woman, the founder of the uh, body shop, Anita Roddick, once said, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try sharing your room with a mosquito. And we're the mosquito in the room of the chocolate industry, constantly buzzing in the back of their ears and hopefully keeping them wide awake at night as a proper mosquito should be doing. How do we think we can reach that humongous mission of 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide? Well, first of all, by simply creating awareness amongst chocolate consumers. Creating awareness about the bitter reality in the cocoa industry that's still there today. Because we're convinced that when consumers and retailers simply hand in hand demand more questions and ask more questions about what they put in their shopping baskets or what they put up on their shelves, that the producers of these products will have to start feel the pressure and will have to change their ways. Now, how do we do this? By creating serious friends. And those are people that not only buy our chocolate, but buy our chocolate and actively promote our mission amongst their friends and family. Now, we're a bit weird in that sense, but we uh, uh, um, had some fun. We opened a little Tony's store in a historical building in the center of Amsterdam where for centuries the cocoa beans were traded. So we're two floors down from where the cocoa beans were traded in Amsterdam and we opened a little store to spread this mission, to not just sell our chocolate, but to spread this mission. Now that store wasn't crazy enough for us, so in November um, we launched a press release saying that we're going to open our own factory on the outskirts of Amsterdam. But a factory is a bit boring. So we went to our kids and we said, you know, kids, how are we going to get half a million people through our factory every year, which is what we want to do, which is quite big. It's one of the bigger attractions in the Netherlands pretty soon. How do you get half a million people through your factory? I asked my kids and they said, Dad, maybe you should have a roller coaster go through your factory. So that roller coaster is going to go through our factory, through our offices, so we have their utmost attention for about 30, 40 seconds and maybe their fear as well, we'll see. Uh, so we can spread this mission in our factory to these half million people as well. So it's all about creating awareness for us. The second step in our strategy is that we want to show the industry that chocolate can be made in a different way, in a more sustainable way, in a more social way, in a better way. How? By following our five-step recipe. Boring consultants would probably call this sourcing principles, but hey, we call it our five-step recipe for slave-free cocoa. First of all, take full responsibility for your value chain, for your whole value chain. So that means source your beans with full traceability, which is almost not done in the world of cocoa. And that means for us, we now work directly with five and a half thousand farmers in Ghana and Ivory Coast through five cooperatives. And why is that essential? 
so we can pay a higher price directly to those farmers. So on top of the farm gate price, which is established by the governments of Ghana and Ivory Coast, we pay the fair trade premium, and on top of that, we pay another 30 to 40% Tony's additional premium to get these farmers to something that we call a living income. Now, you can debate this for hours if you want to, but a living income simply means that you can feed your children, have a roof over their head, send your kids to school, and invest a little bit in your farm to get into this spiral upwards again. So we build really long-term relationships with these farmers on the ground. And why is that essential? Well, by building these relationships, we find out, for example, that a lot of these farms have very old trees that have, bear very little fruit. And we asked them, why is that? They said, well, we don't have the security, the guarantee that we can sell our cocoa beans next year and the year afterwards again. We said, you know what? If you do business with us, we'll guarantee you that we'll buy your beans for five years ahead. And why five years? Because it takes about five years for a little sapling to become a fruit-bearing cocoa tree. And then they can get into this vicious spiral upwards again. And that's a unilateral agreement. They can walk away whenever they want to. They're not forced to sell to us. They can walk away whenever they want to. We actually actively encourage them to not just sell to Tony's because we think economically that's not a good thing if you have only one uh, uh, client. So we help them imp improve their productivity, but we also help them decrease their dependency on cocoa because these prices fluctuate a lot for these people and we sometimes these farmers aren't good enough to stick within cocoa. They need to grow something else, cassava, uh, mango, rubber. And the last step in our strategy is that we help these cooperatives professionalize themselves through management training, et cetera, et cetera. So they have a stronger voice towards the buyers in the middle of that value chain. And that's our five-step recipe for slave-free cocoa. We share online, open source, and for the uh, older CEOs that aren't, are still not on social media, we put it on the inside with our wrappers as well. Um, because the last step in our strategy is that we want to inspire other companies to also take action, to blatantly copy us. And we're being blatantly copied. I can tell you all our recipes are being copied. But we then invite these companies to come over for a cup of coffee and not only copy the front end of our brand, but copy the back end of our brand as well. So that's the whole value chain and the way we do business. Now, we're really proud of the fact that in November we could announce after years of, of talking with them that the biggest retailer in the Netherlands, Albert Heijn, is now from this March onwards sourcing all their chocolate of their private brand through the same principles as our principles, buying them at our cooperatives, paying a higher price, etc. And that's really good news. Why? Because it's also being made by Calabat. And Calabo, or Calabo, uh, if you're French speaking, uh, Calabo uh, produces about half of all the chocolate in the world. And by combining our volume and the volume of Armand Hein, that means that we're reaching a volume at Calabo that they can roll this process out to all the brands that they make chocolate for. And that is big news. Now, we could have become an NGO. We could have become an activist. We chose to become a commercial chocolate brand and change the system from within. Some would call us perhaps a social enterprise, which I'm fine with on one hand because we want to inspire social enterprises that you can become market leader, that you can become financially successful. But on the other hand, we don't want to be put in the niche market of the social enterprises. We want to show entrepreneurship, Holland, Europe, the world, that this is the way you should biz do business anyhow and take responsibility for your whole value chain, whatever you do. So a social enterprise may be because for us financial success isn't a goal. For us financial success is an essential mean towards a goal. The goal is crystal clear. 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide. Now, we always say we're crazy about chocolate, or we're serious about people. Now, we're pretty damn crazy about chocolate. I mean, 10, 15 years ago in the Netherlands, you had four types of chocolate. White, milk, dark, and something with nuts sprinkled into it. We now have 23 recipes that go from crazy to funky to nice to traditional, whatever you feel like. Um, and whenever you come by our office in Amsterdam or here in London, you never leave the office without chocolate. So this is an open invitation during office hours. Sorry, colleagues, they will come by. Um, <laughs> And uh, the good thing is you never leave the office without chocolate. So I bet in Amsterdam and probably in London now we have the happiest mailman in the world walking around. Crazy about chocolate, but we're serious about people. And the number one in our list of serious about people, slightly narcissistic maybe, is our own team. Because we're convinced that only by having the most motivated, engaged, and committed team can we reach that humongous goal of 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide. So we work really hard, but we try to make it as fun as possible. So in your contract, it says that you can take home as much chocolate as you can physically carry each and every day. 
And to keep that slightly within boundaries, you get free running shoes every year. We do boot camp together. We do yoga together. We have a, well, we used to have a BMI bonus. Do you know what a BMI is? Your body mass index? Well, a BMI bonus became slightly politically incorrect, honestly. So we then called it our maintain your BMI bonus. So at least over that year, you maintained your BMI, which is a better thing, I think. And we have a baby bonus. So not all employers like it when you become pregnant. We applaud it. So if you have a child whilst working for Tony's, on the day of birth, you get 1,000 euros cash in your hands, and probably 1,000 pounds, you lucky UK colleagues. Um, uh, and if you make a child with somebody else within Tony's, you each get 1,000 euros in your hands. And seriously, if you then call your child Tony, you get another 1,000 euros. So it's a, it's a business model to make Tony's with Tony's within Tony's work time. Serious about people. Number one, obviously our own team. Two, obviously the five and a half thousand farmers that we build long-term relationships with. Three, the people that buy our bars, so the consumers. Four, the people that sell our bars, so in the UK, Ocado, Waitrose, Sainsbury's, Whole Foods. And on five, the people that make our bars. So that's Gullabout, supplier, etc. Now, if you hear this story about how unequally divided the world of chocolate is, isn't it weird that chocolate bars for the last decades, centuries, have always had that perfectly divided, utterly boring Excel spreadsheet kind of shape? And really boring chocolate brands, and I won't name any names, but you might believe in purple cows, would put their brand name on each and every block of chocolate just in case a consumer might forget halfway through the bar what brand he or she had been eating. Now, there's not a single piece of market research that you can do that'll tell you that it's a good idea to make your bar unequally divided, but we did. Why? Because mostly we don't do too much market research, and two, we don't listen to it. So we take a lot of decisions from our gut, and this felt right. Uh, I gotta tell you though, the week that we launched our unequally divided chocolate bar, there were a lot of complaints. The phone was ringing off the hook, internet was exploding, the most epic complaint was this mother that sent me an email said, my kids used to live in perfect harmony. <laughs> and I have two, I've got two kids, 11 and 12 year olds, and they're always bickering about who gets the biggest block. Obviously the brand block first, and for some reason the button tastes best afterwards. But on a more serious note, we tried to get in touch with all of these people that had a complaint to explain why we had made our bars unequally divided, why that's so relevant, because our bars become a discussion piece. Our bars are our ambassadors. At Tony's, we don't do any form of paid media. So it's all about our bars telling the story of the unequally divided cocoa industry in its purest form. And trust me, if you bring that bar, if that bar makes it home with you tonight even, uh, and you open that bar at the dinner table, your family, friends, husband, hubby, anyone will ask you, why is that thing so une annoyingly unequally divided? And you're gonna have to explain this story. Uh, and that's the whole reasoning behind it. So to explain that story a bit nicely, I'm gonna nick one more minute of you. Um, a little anecdote. We managed to hide the map of Western Africa in our chocolate bars. So it's uh, Ivory Coast and Ghana, and then I hope to the right, there's Nigeria and Cameroon. In the middle, there's two completely independent sovereign states called Togo and Benin. But neither in the block of Togo nor in the block of Benin, a whole hazelnut would fit. So we simply joined Togo and Benin into one block so a whole hazelnut would fit, and we don't tell this story too often in Western Africa. Um, <laughs> And that is how we think a small company can make a serious dent in a rusted down industry, in our case, the chocolate industry. And we're convinced that by ourselves, we can make chocolate, our chocolate, 100% slave free. Well, that's not what we're about. We're about making all chocolate worldwide 100% slave free, together with consumers, with retailers, with our competitors, with governments, etc. It is toch a bewijs that you wel het verschil kan maken. Je moet ergens beginnen, je moet niet nadenken, je moet gewoon beginnen. Iedereen kan gewoon zijn eigen Tony zijn. Dat is natuurlijk ook het verhaal van deze reep. I'm going to leave you with a wise saying from a wise man, Sartre, who once said, once you know something, you cannot unknow something. And once you know something and you're aware, you're responsible. And when you're responsible, it's upon you to act upon that responsibility. So, the very next time you find yourself in a supermarket, and you have this nagging feeling that you had a crappy week and you need something to fix it. Or maybe you had a great week and you need something to celebrate that great week. Just realize that each and every purchase you make 
or for that matter, any business decision or personal decision you make is a choice for the world you want to live in yourself. Thank you very much.